chapter 36 is a bit of review, which uh, many of you will appreciate. I've been promising you that in this AP Biology class, we'd start coming back to some ideas that we've talked about before. For example, um, last chapter, we spent some time talking about mitosis, uh, meristems of plants that do mitosis. Uh, today, we talk about vascular plant transport. And just a quick review, vascular tissue in a plant transports nutrients, okay? And that would be water and then other nutrients. And some of that, I mean, you're talking 100, 200 feet. And a plant doesn't necessarily have a pump for this. So we have to talk about how this works. Okay, here's an example of how high some trees got to bring nutrients, how far some trees got to bring nutrients. There are, uh, there are basically three... Um, scales that transport occurs on. Uh, individual cells transport things from one thing to another. Uh, short distance transport between cells. And then, of course, long distance using vessels, xylem and phloem, two terms that we talked about last time. So here's a general overview, and maybe you already know this. Uh, water in the roots, up the stem, out the leaves. Sugar, made by the leaves in the process of photosynthesis, which we'll cover later, transported down the stem, sometimes all the way to the roots. Carbon dioxide, notice oxygen comes in the roots. Why? Remember, plants still have to do cell respiration. Okay, they still, even though plants, quote, make their own food, they have to take that food and break it down in the process of cell respiration. So plants also have to take in minerals. In chapter 37, we'll talk about nutrients in plants. You already know that plants take carbon dioxide in their leaves and produce oxygen from their leaves. But the reverse happens in the roots. Uh, just in, a, in cells, how do they get minerals in? Uh, a, a concept called co-transport that a plant will use the facilitated diffusion of hydrogen ions. The energy of the moving hydrogen ion is enough to help them pump nitrate ions from low concentration to high concentration into the plant. That's called that's called co-transport, okay? And that's a concept that we briefly mentioned back in chapter six or seven about diffusion, but that's one way plants get things like nitrate ions, anions, in. Anions, nitrate ions are extremely important for plants, as we'll see later. So this is also how uh, plants can take sugar into their cells, even though it's got to go from low concentration to high. So they use co-transport to do this. And here's another example. They use the diffusion of hydrogen ions. Kind of, it's kind of like a revolving door where one person go, pushes on it and goes in, and if you jump in, you get to go along. Kind of the same idea. You know what I mean? If you think about that, that's, that analogy sort of works for co-transport. All right, so how do plants get water? Let's talk about water first. And remember, we had something we talked about first semester called water potential. Water potential uh, determines the direction of movement of water. Water moves from regions of high potential to low potential. And the two numbers were solute potential plus pressure potential equals water potential. In other words, the amount of stuff in a cell as compared to outside Okay, if there's more stuff in a cell, this makes it hypotonic and less stuff outside, water is going to go in. This cell has a high solute potential. High solute potential is low water potential. You could also make water move by putting pressure on it. If you squeeze this cell, if I squeeze it like a sponge, water is going to go out because I've increased the pressure of it. That's water potential, again, just to review. So it affects how plant cells take up water and lose water. 
right? And we're going to come back to this. We talked about this in first semester, and we're going to come back to it now. Uh, I'm going to do this with a... Ooh, I thought there was a picture on this slide. Just a minute. I'm going to go back. There we go. Okay, so we have a cell. We put in a solution that it's in 0.4 molar sucrose solution, which means that this cell has higher water potential than outside of it because of its solute potential. So there's more solute in the cell, I'm sorry, more solute outside the cell than inside. Water will leave. Okay? If we put it in a distilled water solution, because the water potential inside outside the cell is high and the water potential inside the cell is low, water will go in. If you remember that, they say then that this cell is turgid, and they say, I hate these terms, they say that this cell is flaccid, it's not, doesn't have as much stuff in it. So if a plant loses water, they call it turgor loss, here's a plant whose cells are flaccid. Because it hasn't been, because it hasn't been watered, okay, its cells are all droopy because they don't have any water to hold the cell out. So the cells, the cell walls, you have cell walls yet, but the cells are all droopy together. So you water the plant, water goes into the plant, into the cells, high potential to low, and the leaves sort of expand. So let's talk about, uh, we need to talk about a couple more terms that you're going to see, okay? Transport is regulated between plant cells. Because of cell walls and the cell membrane, okay, because of cell walls and the cell membrane, we have different compartments in plant cells. Okay, and then also plant cells have a vacuole, which is where mo most of the water in a plant is located. So here are the compartments, right? Here's a plant cell. Here's its cell wall drawn not to scale. And then you have connections between the cell walls called plasmodesma or plasmodesmata. So cell in plant cells, their, their cytoplasm can be continuous. In other words, because of the connection here, this is how things can go between cells. And of course, this, inside most cells, plant cells, they have a large central vacuole. So a couple terms then. There are two ways water can be transported. You're going to read about this. Okay? You can have the symplastic route, which means that water travels right through the plasmodesma. Sim means together. You can have the apoplastic route, where water actually diffuses through the cell wall and into the next cell, and then through the cell wall and into the next cell. Just in case you see those terms. Symplast and apoplast. Okay, the apoplastic route. Uh, apoplastic route is the term down there. So that that's what this slide is about, and you can pause this if you want to read it, but it's not that important. So water and minerals then absorb, enter the plant through the roots. Okay, through the epidermis of roots, and why do they do it? Well, the water enters through the root hairs or the root. And remember, it's going from high potential in the soil to low potential in the plant cell. Why is it low potential inside the plant? Well, because the plant, because as water goes into the plant, into the root, it travels into the vessels and then travels away. So you're getting less and less water in the root. Remember that one of the reasons root are so good at it is they have root hairs which increase surface area. And if you have an increase in surface area, you have more surfaces for water to enter. The other thing that helps with that is that fungal association called mycorrhizae, which we've talked about in the past. So most plants, and this is a summary of that, roots and fungi form mycorrhizae a symbiotic structure 
consisting of plant roots united with fungal hyphae. And so the hyphae help absorb water. So here's a plant surrounded by mycorrhizae. Here's the root in the middle, and then the mycorrhizae around it. Number three, water and minerals ascend roots to shoots through the xylem. Okay, and, and there's a summary of this here in a minute, but plants lose water through their leaves, called transpiration, and that water has to be transported up from the roots to be replaced. One of the big ideas is at night, when transpiration is really low, roots continue pumping mineral ions using energy into the xylem. The vascular cylinder is basically the xylem. If you pump mineral ions in, you lower water potential. So water comes into the root. We call that root pressure. But this is at night. At night, the plant cells aren't giving off a lot of water because they're not being, they're not being, there's no heat. There's usually not wind, okay, which we'll look at when we look at a transpiration lab later on. So we get some a phenomenon called root pressure. And if you look at this picture, okay, of this strawberry plant, in the morning, you see all these droplets on the edge of the leaves. That's from overnight, roots were forcing water in, and then water was coming out of the tips of the leaves instead of out of the holes in the leaves called stomata, which we'll talk about later. Here's a picture of a leaf. And we looked at these in biology one, but to remind you, and we looked at leaves in our lab, here is, or we're going to look at a leaf cross section. Okay, make sure you know this is the mesophyll palisade layer. This is the spongy layer. And then in here, you have xylem in the center from where water is coming out. Carbon dioxide comes in the openings in the leaves called stomata or stoma, and carbon oxygen goes out, but what also leaves out the stoma is water, okay? And they talk about the water potential idea up here. So in a plant then, basically what you get is you have high water potential here, low in here, so water comes in. Low water potential out here, high in the leaf, water goes out. In the middle, how does water get up the stem? Water gets up the stem because hydrogen bonds between the water molecules make it sticky. So water travels up the stem. I don't know why I'm using green. Make it blue. Water travels up the stem because each water molecule sticks to the one next to it. And so as a water molecule leaves here, the next one is being pulled along. On the leaves are things called stomata. We're going to look at these in lab also. Okay, uh, Stomata are openings in the leaves that look kind of like this. Okay, Here's a picture of a stoma. Here's the opening in the stoma. Here's a closed stoma. These things are called guard cells. Sorry, how they work is when a plant has a, a, guard, a stoma kind of looks like, I'm going to draw it this way. When a stoma has no water, when a plant has little water, the cells are flaccid and they shrink together. But as the plant gets more water and the stoma is filled with water, they swell. And when they swell, I'm going to color them in a little, they create an opening. Now water can go out. Those things are called guard cells, by the way. So a plant can also be cooled by losing water, just like you can when you sweat, which helps um, cool the leaf for enzymes so they don't denature. So here's another view of the same idea. Cell turgid, stomata is open. Cell is flaccid, stomata closes. And it all has to do with the, the cellulose fibers inside of the cell. Same idea here.
Okay, you don't have to know the role of potassium. One plant adaptation, we're going to talk about adaptations a lot pretty soon, are things called zero fights, suffix fight for plant. Plants that are adapted to arid, hot, dry climates. Oops, hot, dry. Their modifications is to put their stoma in the lower leaf surface in pits. So when you're hot and dry and there's a lot of wind in arid climates, uh, you don't want your stomata, because if your stomata are on the top of the leaf, here's a leaf, if they're up here, now the wind goes across and pulls the water molecules away. So you want them to be on the lower leaf surface, away from the wind. Okay, and here's an example of a stomata in this pit. And it actually has actually two little hairs around it to help trap water in. So what about phloem? Well, if you see the word translocation, it's about phloem. How organic nutrients are transported in a plant. And it's a pretty simple idea. It travels from a sugar source to a sugar sink. A sugar source is an organ that produces sugar. Producer of sugar. A sugar sink is a consumer or a storer of sugar, like a bulb or a root. Basically what happens is sucrose is produced in the leaf, diffuses or is pumped out of the leaf. Remember, this is one of those co-transport things. Transported out of the leaf into the phloem. Because there's more sugar up here than down here, sugar is pushed out. Basically, it's like taking a tube of toothpaste and squeezing. You squeeze out the sugar, and then it flows down with gravity and pressure. And then when it gets down here, it diffuses into the plant cell that needs it. So from source to sink. That is it for this chapter.